to to a person become like a universal king. Um, so the our historical Buddha kind of refused. So when the sort of diplomatic process failed, uh, so Mara brought in his uh, army, his soldiers. So you can take it literally or uh, metaphorically. So uh, the soldiers would be all the uh, defilements, like craving, greed, jealousy, hatred, and stuff like that. That is, you want to take it metaphorically. Um, or if you want to take it literally, like, so he sent his uh, troops down to try to uh, attack or stop the Buddha from uh, gaining enlightenment. So somehow uh, he managed to uh, quell the craving. So there was like a message uh, in most Buddhist art when uh, the Buddha gained enlightenment, he had this victory pose where one of his hand is like touching the ground, only one hand, uh, like covering one of the knee and touching the ground in his seated uh, full or half lotus posture. Uh, so that is the victory pose. So it's supposed to be like uh, hinting or uh, indicating to the earth goddess to be the witness, you know, that uh, that seat of enlightenment uh, belonged to the Buddhas. He gained victory. Uh, of course, that is a very uh, <clears throat> literal way of understanding. Uh, and what happened was this uh, earth goddess helped the Buddha by creating like a flood to sort of wash off um, these demon army, the demon army. So when I read that story, it kind of reminded me of uh, a Bible story and uh, this uh, Noah's Ark and the uh, rain and the flood to wash off all the uh, evil uh, beings or evil people or whatever it is. Uh, so I took, uh, of course, the story metaphorically. So the uh, turning of the wheel, when it goes against desire, it kind of have a flashing effect. So when the desire is at its peak, uh, there's lots of pressure, lots of tension, and uh, <clears throat> the uh, reduction of craving requires the flushing away of all these defilements. So that is how I take it metaphorically. Um, so that's how the Buddha got enlightened, so that some of the devas know about it. So basically, uh, the human audiences weren't the first disciples or weren't the first audiences. So you know, some devas might have encountered the, the Buddha, received some teachings, uh, and uh, you know, he traveled along the way and found the first five contemplatives, and uh, he declared. So he needs to declare various classes of beings, uh, devas, maras, um, Brahmas, so Brahmas would be the first Brahma would be the Brahma Sampati, the uh, Brahma that invited the uh, Buddha to teach the teachings. Uh, if I'm not wrong, um, Brahma Sampati is in the uh, pure abode. Pure abode. So that's how we. Uh, that's according to what I found from SS to Insight. Um, I may not have the sut direct sutta reference, but that's what I found. Um, but so that's how these uh, Brahma Sampati already know about the middle path before the Buddha got enlightened. So he was uh, like manifesting himself like a musician, uh, showing the uh, the Buddha, Buddha to be what's the middle way, you know, how to tune the string, not too tight, not too loose. So he already had an idea what's the middle way. Um, so that's for the uh, Brahma Sampati giving clues. Um, and when we talk about the first five contemplatives, it takes uh, some convincing. So if there's no authenticity in the, his discovery, then the first five disciples won't be convinced. It's not just in theory, but also in terms of like uh, the vibes. It is. Uh, like belief, like precursor to this uh, lecture or this sermon, 
the Buddha was walking to the first five contemplatives and without speaking a word, the five contemplatives uh, decided to give up their seat, uh, prepare a seat for the Buddha to have a seat, uh, despite agreeing beforehand you know, not, not to uh, pay attention to the Buddha when he came. Right? Because he's vibe, you know, he's, uh, his energy is so different, so peaceful, so calm, you know, like he found a way already. Right, so he, they were so uh, uh, curious, so convinced to find the truth. So eventually, uh, they listened, and at the end of the discourse, right, so this is what the Buddha declared: uh, knowledge and vision arose in him. Uh, so the next slide. Okay, uh, so that is what the Blessed One said. Gratified a group of five monks, delighted in the Blessed One's words. And while this explanation was being given, there arose to Venerable Kondanya the dustless, stainless dhamma I. Whatever is subject to origination is all subject to cessation. So we have uh, one of the five that attained or realized the truth, at least uh, become a sotapanna, stream enterer. So uh, at that point of time, he's still not yet fully enlightened. It is only in the second sermon, the uh, Anatta Lakana Sutta, the Discourse on Non-Self, that all five disciples eventually became an Arahant. So the uh, <clears throat> first person that uh, really had a glimpse of the truth is this uh, Venerable Kondanya. So basically the rest of the four uh, kind of like uh, delighted uh, in theory, or probably delighted in the presentation, but uh, did not understand or fully actualize uh, the meaning behind the sermon. So only one of them did. Yeah? Um, so let's see what happens next. Okay, and when the Blessed One had set the wheel of Dhamma in motion. Okay, so the wheel of Dhamma uh, can be set in motion only when somebody <coughs> understood the truth. If the, let's say the Buddha was just uttering to himself or to somebody or some deva that do not understand, then somehow it's still not considered turning the wheel, not setting the wheel of Dhamma in motion. That means there's no propagation take, taking place. Eh? Uh, so like uh, instance, this uh, Naga king, this uh, Muchalinda was sheltering uh, the Buddha after he got enlightened during a heavy rain. Uh, the Buddha uttered something, some Dhamma verses. Whether the serpent or the Naga king understood or not, I do not know. So there wasn't any uh, turning of the wheel of Dhamma. So only in this particular sermon it is mentioned that uh, Venerable Kondanya understood. So that's when the wheel of Dhamma is uh, turned or set in motion. Okay, so the earth devas cried out uh, near Varanasi, the deer park at Isipatana. So talk about the venue, Varanasi, Isip Isipatana. Uh, the Blessed One has set in motion the unexcelled wheel of Dhamma that cannot be stopped by contemplative or Brahman, Deva, Mara or Brahma, or anyone at all in the cosmos. <clears throat> so what happened was these uh, <clears throat> earth devas, right? So, um, so now the Chinese uh, hungry ghost one is uh, about to come to an end. So a lot of times, uh, like in the Chinese culture, uh, where these sort of beings were sort of like roaming around, uh, a lot of times these beings may not be like hungry ghosts. A lot of times uh, these might also be the earthbound deities. So if they have like the ability to uh, sort of like... Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, like you know, like 
a lot of times in uh, cultures, like in movies or in dramas or in shows, uh, those unseen beings that can uh, harass or uh, you know, harm people, uh, th normally those aren't the hungry ghosts. Huh? Hungry ghosts are facing too much suffering, too much suffering to even bother to disturb people. Uh, so the, the beings that uh, somehow cause harm or disturbances usually are the earthbound deities, usually. Usually they are closest to the human realm. Um, maybe the humans were uh, disturbing their territory or causing some uh, something to upset them, right? So uh, these beings will uh, do something to try to chase uh, these human occupants away. Um, so the earthbound deities nearby uh, were sort of also listening to what happened and uh, somehow they cried out. <clears throat> uh, it is believed, huh? so this is again my interpretation, the heavenly beings uh, perceive uh, humans uh, in terms of brightness. Yeah, because these uh, beings have the divine eye. So if somebody realized the truth, uh, they'll probably have like a different kind of uh, state of mind, different kind of aura, different kind of brightness. So let's say this uh, Venerable Kondanya become this uh, uh, stream enterer, this Sotapanna, then at least uh, they, they know the spreading has been successful, so they sort of cried out. Right, the motion of unexcelled will of Dhamma that cannot be stopped by contemplative of Brahman, Deva, Mara, or Brahma, or anyone at all in the cosmos. So uh, there is the birth of a Sapma Sam Buddha. That means a Supreme Buddha. So again, in uh, Buddhism, uh, it is believed that the uh, first person who is able to rediscover uh, the truth, that means the path to enlightenment. So of course there are people in the past who had uh, discovered the path before. So if let's say the path is lost and the first person who rediscovered the path again and is able to spread the teachings, they are called the Supreme Buddha. So our historical Buddha is the Supreme Buddha. But if let's say a person uh, sort of rediscover the truth, but unable to teach, or decided not to teach, then we call them the silent Buddha, Pacheka Buddha. So our historical Buddha actually almost became a silent Buddha. If let's say the uh, Brahma Sampati's request failed, then uh, the Buddha decided to just sit under the Bodhi tree and spend uh, the rest of his days uh, of his life not teaching then he'll be the silent Buddha. Excuse me. <clears throat> and we have a third kind of Buddha. So this is a, a post-canonical terminology. Uh, we call them the hearer Buddhas, Sawaka Buddha. So a Sawaka Buddha is basically also an Arahant. So these are the Buddhas, uh, uh, they appear when the teachings are already around, when the path is already been practiced, the teachings are around. So anybody that uh, gained enlightenment in our uh, Sakyamuni Buddha's era, that's a hearer Buddha. So if let's say anybody attain enlightenment now at this time, they are called the hearer Buddhas as well. So sometimes you may hear terms like uh, uh, living Buddha, <laughs> although we, in our tradition we don't use that. Uh, so we technically we know it's not the Supreme Buddha. So the living Buddha, if it is true that they got enlightened, then most probably they are the hearer Buddhas, Sawaka Buddha. Yeah? So these are the uh, terminologies, uh, post-canonical terminologies, the Sawaka Buddha. Uh, okay, so on hearing the earth devas cry, the devas of the four great kings took up the cry. So above the 
earth-bound devas is the four great kings or the four heavenly kings. Huh? So these four heavenly kings is not the uh, Andy Lau or the Aaron Kwok, uh, those people. Huh? So these four heavenly kings are the uh, deities in charge of the uh, four races. Uh, so I can't remember all four. Uh, the Nagas, Yakas, Gandabas, and uh, one more. Yeah? So total there are four races, four species. Uh, and if you look at the chart of the 31 planes, these four heavenly kings is right above the human realm. So basically the earthbound devas are classified together with the four great kings. They are part of the, uh, their domain actually. So the four great heavenly kings are kind of in charge of the races of these earthbound spirits. So sometimes you may hear uh, the uh, water naga or the mountain uh, naga, stuff like that, mountain uh, or the river dragons. So these are part of the domain of the four great kings. So, um, so the four great kings, uh, how they know about it, um, I would say that uh, their cry might be like a party. Yeah? So they make too much noise, uh, then the beings above feel disturbed, feel the disturbance, and they pick up the signal and they too cry out. So they make a big, uh, that big cry. So these uh, four great heavenly kings took up the cry also. And the beings above, the devas or the 33, also heard it and took up the cry and the devas of the hours. Uh, so let me see what's the Pali <clears throat> uh, So the four great kings will be the Chatu Maharajika Deva, uh, then the devas of the 33 is Tava Tingsa Deva, uh, then devas of the hours called the Yama Devas. Yama Devas. So interestingly, the Yama Devas also are mentioned like in hell. Normally like the, the judge of hell is also called a Yama. So I'm not sure whether is it the, the same Yama or a different Yama, but it's the same word. Eh? So uh, maybe somebody from above is in charge of the hell department. So uh, so these hours, uh, Devas or the hours, these Yama Devas, uh, are above the devas of the 33. Eh? <clears throat> then afterwards, the contented devas. So these contented devas are the Tusita and Deva. So it is believed that the next Buddha, the next Buddha to be, this uh, Maitreya Bodhisatta, is residing currently in this Tusita heaven. So basically, like all the uh, Buddhas to be are in queue at this uh, Tusita heaven. And previously, before our uh, uh, historical Buddha was born on earth, he was also in this realm, in this uh, Tusita realm, eh, this uh, contented devas. So it is believed that he passed away from that realm. Before he passed away, he passed the baton over to this uh, Maitreya, yeah? Maitreya Bodhisattva. So currently is still waiting up there in heaven. Uh, the post-canonical uh, belief will be that uh, <clears throat> uh, the Buddhas or the teachings uh, won't reach that realm because if uh, the beings receive the teachings and they got enlightened, uh, then they, they won't uh, become a Buddha. So they kind of omit that realm and uh, you know, they have stories such as the uh, Buddha's biological mother being born in this uh, Tusita uh, Deva realm and in the Devo Day, right? Where the Buddha is supposedly teaching the Abhidhamma to his uh, mother, this uh, Queen Mahamaya Devi, reborn, uh, sorry, uh, Queen Mahamaya, yeah? Reborn as a deva, they have to come. She has to come down to these uh, devas of the thirty-three to receive teachings. 
So that's again a post-canonical story. So again, I'm not sure how accurate it is or how true, but uh, we take it out of faith. Um, so then next level, we have the Devas delighting in creation. So that's the Nimanarati Deva. Yes, so the Devas delight in creation. <clears throat> so this uh, is not the creation of like uh, the world and stuff like that. Uh, it, it could be creation of uh, some people interpret creation of cultures, creation of uh, knowledge and stuff like that. So uh, these are uh, Devas delighting in creation. And if you believe in ancient aliens, uh, probably they create some DNA, some new species and stuff like that. So again, it's all speculation. Eh? Okay, the devas wielding power over creation of others. So these devas um, also have a boss. right? So somebody needs to regulate the creation. They need to have some kind of... Uh, boundary yeah? you cannot uh, create something maybe too destructive or, or disturbing the balance so you have some uh, somebody above to regulate them so they are the paranimita what uh, paranimita vasavati devas uh, in the pali language and eventually the devas of brahma's retinue so all the devas from the human uh, above the human realm or including the human realm, all the way up to this uh, devas wielding power over creation of others, belong to the desire realm devas. So these devas uh, somehow uh, are not in the jhanic state. That means they do not need to achieve concentration to be reborn there. They just need to do lots of good, lots of, create lots of merit, and that would be uh, sufficient enough for them to be reborn in those realms. Uh, whereas the devas of Brahma's retinue require some form of concentration, some form of uh, samadhi. So the devas of Brahma's retinue and above are the different Brahma worlds uh, require samadhi. Yeah, so uh, things like practicing loving kindness or also uh, may lead to samadhi. Okay, next. So the last slide, please. Okay, uh, so this is the conclusion. Um, so we've uh, about to finish this, the last lap. So in that moment, that instant, the cry shot right up to the Brahma worlds. Uh, there is a longer version. So this uh, is like a shorter version. The longer version would kind of extend and uh, describe all the various Brahma realms as well. Uh, and this 10,000-fold cosmos shivered and quivered and quaked. So it's not an uh, apocalyptic event. Uh, it might be metaphorical. Probably the cries are too noisy, so everyone heard the cries. Uh, so that's the quivering and shaking of the universes. Uh, while a great measureless radiance appeared in the cosmos, surpassing the effulgence of the deities. So when a person uh, gets enlightened or uh, realize the truth or have a glimpse of the truth, uh, they will have uh, this bright light. So it's kind of like a signal for everybody. Okay, uh, somebody uh, attained something. Uh, then the Blessed One exclaimed, So you really know, Kondanya. So you really know. And that is how Venerable Kondanya acquired the name Anya Kondanya. Kondanya who knows. Right, so uh, uh, the Buddha kind of uh, also looked at the, uh, the uh, events surrounding himself, the deities and uh, all all the screaming and the cries happening and uh, it kind of like uh, usually right uh, in other suttas he'll also double check uh, the Buddha himself has the mind reading ability so he kind of checked the mind of Venerable Kondanya so he 
kind of uh, notice, probably notice that he uh, has attained stream entry. So that's how he confirmed when Mukundanya got this uh, achievement. So in the Buddha's time, the Buddha can certify you know, who has realized the truth, who has not realized the truth. Nowadays, uh, a bit hard to certify. <laughs> a bit hard to certify. Okay, uh, so that's the end of the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta. So I open the floor for Q&A, just nice, it's uh, yeah, 9, around 9 plus. Uh, anyone has any questions? Uh, Bhante, on that point, um, on whether we know there are any realized practitioners or not, are there any uh, that's currently living with us? Uh, I would say as long as uh, there is sincerity in practicing the Eightfold Path, there will be. There will be, yeah. In the past, people have claimed like um, the Lady Mechi Kao or uh, Ajahn Chah was uh, enlightened or something, right? But, um, like, do we have like known um, teachers that are there? Uh, so a lot of things like uh, um, sometimes uh, we can take all these news or, or uh, hearsay with a pinch of salt. Ultimately, we need to verify ourselves and also um, uh, external teachers, you know, whether they are enlightened or not is one thing. Uh, ultimately, it's uh, ourselves, you know, whether we can actualize the teachings that is uh, most important. Thank you. Okay, all right, no problem. Okay, anyone else? Oh, okay, I'll understand the sutta. Anybody got... Oh, uh... got stream at already. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't hear any crying. <laughs> <laughs> you must have the divine ear huh, to hear the crying. Okay, um, if not, we take a break, five-minute break, then we come back for the guided session. So in the meantime, we can also think of questions along the way. So see you all back in uh, five minutes. So the key takeaway, uh, how Anya Kondanya got his awakening is because is able to see uh, arising and passing, uh, whatever is subject to arising is subject to passing away. So before we uh, do that contemplation, or in fact, uh, since we are regulars here, uh, we should be doing that contemplation, uh, like uh, we call this the right mindfulness throughout the whole day. Uh, but if let's say whatever reason we sort of lapse in our mindfulness, we forget about it, then we need to have uh, uh, reformat or restarting the system. Huh? So we uh, make sure we tune ourselves, and body upright and relaxed. Okay, and we are going to start off with a bit of uh, visualizations. We are going to think of all the hairs, hairs of the head, hairs of the body, and wish them well and happy. So this to avoid the extreme of aversion. And the wishing of the hair is well and happy, that is part of right thought of the Eightfold Path. And every time we think of a new image, that is using the mind sense door. So 
So that is mindfulness of the Dhamma, yeah? right mindfulness, mindfulness of the phenomenon. And when new contact arise, new image arise, that is subject to clinging, you know? subject to clinging and craving. So we need to keep repeating. Wishing it well and happy, new image arise, well and happy. So we call this right effort. We maintain and develop a wholesome state of mind. So once the mind is uh, relatively at ease or at peace, then that's the most conducive time to introduce the truth of impermanence. So all these hairs go through birth, aging, sickness and passing away. So this impermanence is to overcome this greed and attachment. Which is the other extreme. So we're going to keep observing arising and passing, arising and passing of the hairs. So this exercise we are actually not training the hairs, eh? we are actually training to let go of the five aggregates. So when you think of the hair, we are actually, and that's the perception of the hair, yeah? versus the mind sense door, the mind consciousness, mind door consciousness, that's the fifth aggregate. And every time you think of a new image, hair growing or hair falling, anytime a new image appears, that is mental formation, that's the fourth aggregate. And when you think of the hairs, that's perception or memory, you need to refer to how the hair look like, you know, have I seen it before in the past, you need to bring up certain image of the past to kind of generate this uh, effect. So even though the hair doesn't look exactly like yours, no, not everybody has 100% photographic memory, uh, no, you still can generate an image, so we call this perception. Perception is an illusion, eh? it's not 100% real. So that's the third aggregate. And every time uh, you contact or cognize uh, the hairs, you also have feelings, either you find it pleasant, unpleasant or neutral. So that's the second aggregate. And the first aggregate is form. So that's the subtle form, subtle elements, earth, fire, wind, water elements that make up the hairs. So anytime you can detect any sensation of the elements that can uh, sort of travel to your mind door, so that traveling to the mind door is the craving. So 
And if you observe impermanence, these formations will uh, subside or kind of lower. So it's not just the uh, physical hairs, uh, it's also all the five aggregates. We can observe it arising and passing. Basically, they are five in one. So if you can't multitask, then you just do one at a time. And we can ask ourselves, are these hairs truly self? Can we tell the hairs not to go through birth and death? The next uh, part of the body, we are going to think of the nails, fingernails and toenails and wish them well and happy. And all the nails are subject to birth, aging, sickness, and passing away. So they keep growing and falling, growing and falling, many, many cycles. Okay, then we can ask ourselves, are these nails or the five aggregates <clears throat> associated with the nails, are they truly self? So we can also observe with uh, reflection of impermanence, does the sense of self, sense of clinging and becoming, that means the sense of selfishness or ego, is it increasing or decreasing? with uh, impermanence. So if a person just <clears throat> do this all the way, just take one object and mindful of impermanence all the time, uh, 
one fine day eh, this uh, ego right will hopefully like disappear so that's supposedly the end point but our attention span is not 100% uh, how do you call it permanent it cannot last for long so we sometimes change to a different object different sense door so we need to be mindful of all this uh, dharma this phenomenon as well so the next uh, object we are moving is into the teeth and we wish all the teeth well and happy And all these teeth are subject to birth, aging, sickness, and passing away. So we can think of them growing and falling, growing and falling, many, many cycles. Even though the teeth fall off the most twice, we can uh, keep repeating. It's more of a mental detachment exercise. And we can ask ourselves, are these teeth or the five aggregates associated with the teeth, are they truly self? Can we tell them not to go through birth and death? So next is the skin. And we wish all the skin well and happy from head to toe. And we patch our skin, we wish it well and happy.
and all the skin are subject to birth, aging, sickness and passing away. They keep thinking how they grow and fall off, grow and fall off, many, many cycles, five aggregates arising and passing. And we can ask ourselves, are this skin truly self? And we tell the skin not to go through birth and death. So the next phase of meditation, we are moving to the sublime states. Uh, no need to uh, visualize anything, we're just feeling the sensations within the body, so that's the body sense door, uh, it's more of the four elements meditation, so uh, any sensation that's hard and soft, that's the earth element, fire will be hot and cold sensations, wind, fast, slow movements, and water, moist or dry. So there's no need to deliberately create those sensations. You let it appear naturally by itself. So it's more like a real-time observation. Anything that you can detect or appear, then you wish it well and happy. The more we have thoughts of uh, goodwill or right thoughts, then uh, the craving you should observe should reduce, so the mind should settle down, so one can uh, detect the settling of the mind by the settling of formations.
and if you find the mind quite settled then we can remember this baseline emotion uh, no jhanas, no insight eh, for this point of time where we take note of this emotional signpost so we're going to carry on our journey uh, we're going to wish all beings in all directions well and happy above, below and all across no need to push out the mind, we just let it extend or expand naturally by itself and again no need to visualize how all sentient beings look like when the mind extends it will naturally encompass all sentient beings along the way so we are going to uh, perceive all sentient beings as the elements or the aggregates So all beings are made of the four elements and five aggregates. That's the uh, non-discriminative way to cover all sentient beings. So whatever sensation you can detect, near or far, you we can wish all beings well and happy. So we're going to add two important words, all beings, inside the wish so when this uh, new sensation arrives we wish all beings well and happy so we keep repeating that wish So we're kind of like expanding this uh, one-pointedness by covering up the uh, or overlapping the sense doors yeah so with this expanded mind that's a giant one-pointedness And if we place more attention to that uh, elements and sensations rather than reacting to the stimuli, then we are able to withdraw or quite withdraw from the senses. And the wishing of all beings well and happy may lead to the first level of concentration part of right concentration in the Noble Eightfold Path if there's a change in emotion eh, from the blender kind of baseline emotion to something more happy or joyful so that's the emotion or the first level of concentration 
and regardless of what you may experience, continue to wish all beings well and happy. And next we add some insight and we're going to uh, reflect all uh, beings, all dharmas are impermanent, they arise and pass away. So you keep observing the arising and passing of all elements or sensations. Regardless of what one may experience, continue mindful of impermanence. So the more uh, one reflects on impermanence, the Joy and happiness should dissipate and you slowly turn into this emotion called equanimity. So equanimity is a neutral and a uplifting kind of experience. So the combination of this uh, loving kindness and impermanence may lead to the fourth level of concentration. So again, regardless of what you may experience, continue to be mindful of impermanence. Keep uh, spinning the Dharma wheel.
then we can move on to the second sublime state, which is equanimity, uh, sorry, compassion. So from compassion we wish all beings, may they be free from suffering. So there's some very closely related to the Four Noble Truths. So to be uh, closer to the Four Noble Truths, we use the five clinging aggregates. Yeah, so all beings will experience the five clinging aggregates. They are subject to clinging and suffering. So every time we detect a new sensation, we wish all beings free from suffering. So the mundane kind of compassion will be over speculating or imagining okay how to help this person, how to help that person. So that's the mundane kind of compassion which is already clinging to stories, eh? stories made up by the mind. Whereas the middle path kind of compassion is every moment detachment from contact Every time we have new sensation, we generate the good thought and the right thought to wish all beings free from suffering. If the mind starts to calm down, craving calm down, then the mind uh, on this compassion should lead to the second level of concentration denoted by the emotion of joy and happiness. So if your compassion is not like a sad or depressive kind of emotion, but you have joy and happiness, that means that's the concentrative kind of compassion. And next we add some insight, 
We're going to reflect how to truly overcome this uh, suffering. So to have real compassion, we also need to practice detachment. Uh, so all uh, dharmas are impermanent. All the aggregates, all the sensations, they arise and pass away. Similarly, the more one contemplates our impermanence, the joy and happiness should uh, dissipate. And whatever states of calmness or peacefulness you may experience, continue to be mindful of impermanence. Not doing so or idling would be clinging, eh? clinging to a form of formless becoming. So the combination of this uh, compassion combined with insight may lead to the state of mind called the perception of infinite space. So it's not like the equanimity one experiences earlier, but a sense of spaciousness. So regardless of one may experience, uh, continue to be mindful of impermanence. Don't get lost in space. Eh?
we try to find how far can these uh, formations or craving settle down. Is there like an end point? So we are not pushing the formations down, we are mindful in permanence, the settling is like the byproduct or an indicator. So before we conclude, a uh, same gentle reminder, we still can be mindful of the four sublime states or the uh, impermanence, be it standing, sitting, walking, or lying down. And with that, we can gently open our eyes. Formally, we end the session, but informally, still can generate right thought. Okay, uh, any problems or questions? All good. All right, uh, then we can do the closing uh, chant. <clears throat> okay, dedicating uh, merits. Akasata japumata devanaga mahitika punyam tamanu moditva chirang rakantu loka sasanam Etavata ca amhehi sampadang punya sampadang sabe deva sabe futa sabe sata anumodantu sabha sampati siddhiya Dedication of merits to departed Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita ho tu nyata yu Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita ho tu nyata yu Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita ho tu nyata yu Aspiration Imina punya kamina Mami bala samagamo Satang samagamo ho tu Yavani bana patiya Sadu, sadu, sadu All right, uh, any announcements from Terence? Okay, if not, uh, then good night See you all next week So I think next week we can start the new topic On the uh, Bahi, <coughs> Bahia Sutta So Ari, make sure you are in <laughs> your, your topic thank you okay all right see you all uh, next week thank you good night. thank you good night okay.